Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to The Cutting Room, the movie show by All The Right Movies. My name is Luke, and with me are Westy. Hello. And Matt. Hi. There's been nice. an eruption at ADRM. <laughs> <laughs> Straight in. <laughs> couldn't help myself. Of course you couldn't. <laughs> and there's going to be plenty of verbals as we discuss the British crime classic, The Long Good Friday. Mm. It's a film that... I've certainly wanted to talk about for a long time. I'm thrilled that we're doing it here. But frostbite or verbals, Westy? Why do you want to talk about the Long Good Friday? Uh, because I was told to. <laughs> 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 uh, I hadn't seen this, and it came up on the the WhatsApp group that we have, and what we're going to talk about next. And you guys were like, "Long Good Friday." And I was like, "I haven't seen it." And I was like, well, just get that remedied immediately. And I'm yeah. so so pleased that I did, and I thoroughly. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's going to be a really good film to talk about. And I'll tell you what, Guy Ritchie's seen this, hasn't he? Of course, yeah. Yeah, once <laughs> or twice. Seen He's certainly twice. seen it a couple of times, hasn't he? Um, yeah, got lots from it. Really enjoyed it. Watched it and then watched it immediately after. Yeah, loved it. What about you, Matt? Mm. Well, like you, Luke, I've been wanting to talk about this one for a while now. Because mm. I remember when I first started reading Empire Magazine, I was about 14. And I remember one of the very first issues I got that gave away like a little book, which was something like 100 films you have to see. Right. And The Long yeah. Good Friday was in there. And I'll always remember what they said about it, which was something like, next time you come home from the cinema, disappointed in a movie, just watch the last scene of The Long Good Friday to remind yourself right. how good cinema could be, which yeah. is obviously quite a big statement to make. And I was just Huge. sold on that already. So I was really mm. keen to see it. And obviously we will talk about that last scene, but... It does have so much more to it than that. I think in general in Britain, we don't do a lot of good gangster films. It's not something we do particularly well, I would say. Mm-hmm. But this one, this one still stands up. It's got real punch to it. It's got real heft. And I'm just looking forward to some great Bob Hoskins impressions from us all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this, I mean, a favorite of mine. I love it. I think I watched it in my mid-teens when I was getting a little bit more seriously into film, and it's one that I'd read about. And Maybe it was a similar thing with you, Matt. I mm. might have read it in Empire Magazine, mm. as is the same with a lot of films that we talk about. Yeah. Mm. And I think I bought it on VHS like straight away, and it's been with me ever since. I mean, the VHS hasn't been with me ever since. That would be, <laughs> that would be mental That'd in be 2022. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, Tom, tell you all. <laughs> Well, what first um, attracted us to the film was that, like its nastiness. It's mm. like really, really bleak ending. Obviously, <laughs> that performance, powerhouse yeah. from Bob Hoskins. Oh, it's amazing! It's oh, so Jesus much grit Christ. in this film. Yeah. It's so gritty. Yeah. And I think viewing it now, it's a, it's a great like time portal back to London in the late seventies, early eighties, and it's fascinating to compare like then and now. Mm-hmm. And finally, it contains one of my favorite all time movie scores. <laughs> That main theme from Francis yeah. Monkman is yeah. so loud and yeah. sleazy. I can't get enough of it. <laughs> you got it on vinyl. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> if I had, it'd be displayed. Yeah, more playing now as you were talking. <laughs> Constantly on a loop. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, great. So, who lit the fuse that tore Harold's world apart? We'll find out as we get up to our Jacobs in the criminal world of 80s London. Let's do it. And lads, try and be discreet, eh? (laughs) Set against the backdrop of an Easter weekend, criminal kingpin Harold Chan plans to redevelop London's Docklands in a deal legitimised by his American friends. I mean, but they are gangsters, after all. Yeah. (laughs) It's not that legitimate. (laughs) No. But his organisation is shattered by an unknown and unseen enemy, threatening Harold's grip on London's underworld. Written by Barry Keefe, directed by John McKenzie, produced by Barry Hansen for Handmade Films and released on the 29th of March 1981, The Long Good Friday stars Bob Hoskins as Harold Shand, Helen Mirren as Victoria, Derek Thompson as Jeff, and Eddie Constantine as Charlie. Yeah. We're going to be talking about the main players in The Long Good Friday organisation, before we pick our individual highlights and score the film out of 10. And we're starting with the director. The director of The Long Good Friday was John Frenzy McKenzie. He's known in the business as Frenzy McKenzie. <laughs> starting out as an assistant to Ken Loach, McKenzie cut his teeth on British TV before directing his masterpiece, The Long Good Friday. Post-production was a bit of a nightmare for all involved. Shooting finished in 1979 and it was planned for a theatrical release but the rights to the film changed hands quite a few times, eventually landing with Black Lions Productions, a subsidiary of IDV, 
the head of the company, mm. Lou Grade, saw a cut of the film and he hated it. He saw it as glorifying violence and he was fearful that the IRA would blow up cinemas in England. I mean, that's extreme. <laughs> yeah. Extreme guys? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to annoy them. No. <laughs> not Certainly not in 1981. No. No. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> So it was then slated for a TV release, 83 minutes in length, with all the violence and colourful language removed, with Hoskins' voice dubbed over by an actor from Birmingham, David Dacre. This was, wow. this was to make it more palatable for American audiences. Hoskins threatened to sue and producer Barry Hansen was furious. Understandably. And I saw 10 minutes of it and said, you'll knit. Take out all the violence <laughs> and bad language. It's still 83 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, no. that's all right. I don't think just so. Just Hoskins yeah, in the shower, so. yeah. lingering on him <laughs> for ages. You <laughs> 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 wouldn't love that. <laughs> Think of that psycho, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but at the eleventh hour, George Harrison came to his rescue, and his handmade films company bought it and put it out in theaters about a year after it was screened. A Cannes Film yeah. Festival. So, a troubled history, Matt. What mm. do you think of Frenzy McKenzie's work on The Longer Friday? <laughs> Frenzy McKenzie. Um, it's exceptional, really. And what I want to talk about is his location shooting, because that is oh, one of the most yes. cinematic representations of London I've ever seen. If someone asks me, mm -hmm. what's a good London film? I think I would say, first and foremost, Long Good Friday, because it's a proper yeah, character in the film. And where it's set is so intrinsically linked with Harold as a character as well. But everywhere yeah. Mackenzie shoots, he just makes the most of it. Love all the, the scenes on Howard's ship going down the Thames and all those mm -hmm. conversations he has with, on the harbour with the docks behind him. Like so many important yeah. conversations happen there with those framed in the background. When he finds out mm -hmm. Colin is being killed, it's on the dock side. When Brilliant. he's killed Jeff and is with Victoria, it's on the dock side. And like I say it's yeah. intrinsic to Harold's character. You know, he's so proud of where he comes from. You know, he says, I run London. This is my mm -hmm. manor when he's given the whole speech on the board, you know, giving it all the big, this is the greatest city in Europe. He's so proud of being a Londoner. And when he goes yeah. searching for Errol the Ponce, he's so disgusted by the fact that area has become a slum because he used to yeah. mean something to him coming from that area. So mm. London is a proper character in this film. And there's so many other great choices. Um, I know they used two locations from the swimming pool murder, the swimming pool and mm -hmm. the showers were two different places, but they both look great. The outside restaurant, I love that, where Jeff gets spat on by the widow, the church Brilliant. where the yeah. car gets blown up, the casino. And, of course, there's a Voy Hotel where Howell gets nabbed. They've all got real character to them, and there's a real sense mm -hmm. of history this film, which is what Howell is so proud of. It's just really well chosen. And I know the only one they yeah. built is the line in the Unicorn pub because, obviously, they needed that to be false because they're going to blow it up. But it was so convincing, yeah. passers-by were wandering in trying to get served. Because I thought it was a new pub that was being built. Brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. This is a new pub. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> where did this come from? Really, yeah. It's really British, that, isn't it? Let's go to that new place. Yeah. It was just like sprung up overnight. Let's go in there. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, directed really crack and paste, but it's a truly great London film because that location yeah. shooting. And it's not just a case, oh, it looks good. London is Harold in this film. So I think location yeah. shooting is, is so important and it's brilliantly yeah. done. Well, I'm a fan of uh, Frenzy McKenzie's visual storytelling in the film. That whole opening segment's seven minutes long, and the only dialogue mm. is just the incidental stuff in the bar with Colin asking mm. for drinks. Nothing until we get to Jeff and Councillor Harris sitting outside yeah. the Boulevard restaurant. It can get quite complicated, but Mackenzie sets it up so intriguingly. We know there's a deal somewhere that's gone wrong. Shady dealings with the courier, two dead bodies, no dialogue, a hold up as well. And the intrigue is helped by those incredible synth notes in the score as well. And that's a theme throughout. It's a film so rich with memorable street dialogue, it's easy to forget that there are a lot of scenes without any dialogue whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The bomb scene outside the church, nothing. The scene in the swimming pool where Colin gets striped up mm. has only got one word uttered by Brosnan, and that's high, and that was unscripted. Yeah. That was improv, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was no dialogue. <laughs> I didn't have to read for this part. <laughs> the explosive retaliation scene at the racetrack. Loads of jeopardy in that scene with the sniper aiming in the office, mm. Harold pacing yeah. around, waiting for the boss outside. Loads of tension, no dialogue. And the montage scene after, Jeff's, after Jeff gets glassed, Harold and Victoria are at home and there's no dialogue as the camera lingers on Harold's huge barrel-chested physique in the shower. <laughs> He's like a bull, isn't he? He's yeah. massive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's unspoken, but there are big religious themes in that for me. Harold washing away his sins, the ritualistic burning of his clothes on the barbecue. Yeah. So, and, But no dialogue. And it goes without saying, no dialogue in that unforgettable end. 
I will say that no matter how much I do love that opening sequence, it does have a slight negative impact on the scene when Jeff gets killed. He throws in so much exposition into that scene. Mm. This person and the other thing, Colin, Eric and Harris and the other guy, I find it really, really difficult to keep up. I've, I've seen this film a lot of times. 20 maybe maybe more and right. i couldn't confidently explain to you why the ira are pissed off at harold yeah even now yeah so you got my colin to deliver for harris money to belfast i don't know if i'm i'm alone in that but i'm just I'm, what who who who, who? Yeah. what are these guys because they're all ordinary names they're not really identifiable I know, yeah, like yeah. colin and eric and jack and jeff right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know if someone had these nickname and I know fingers, you yeah, know. Yeah. Errol the Ponds, <laughs> he should have been. Somebody like that. Errol the Ponds. Yeah. Errol the Ponds, perfect. <laughs> Razor's yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or to give him his full title, Eric the Ponds from Brixton. <laughs> <laughs> As if there's an Eric the Ponds from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> from Wapping. <laughs> Wapping, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Eric the Ponce, the other one. <laughs> the other one. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so I think Mackenzie could have made a few script changes in the second act to make that scene a little mm. less exposition heavy. But overall, I do like the trail of breadcrumbs that he does, that he leaves throughout the film. Yeah. Little hints that are not fully explained at the time and get revealed later on. Yeah. But it's yeah. just a little bit too heavy handed in that scene for me. But what I also love from Mackenzie is that you, when you watch this film and it opens on that house and you've got them really mm. great no nonsense in your face bold font long good friday directed by me in your face house right great <laughs> lovely great. here we are and it's just a jigsaw big fat jigsaw pieces and every one of them is just so palatable every one of them is just so brilliant to explore and he just kind of moves them way i'll put that over there i'll put that over there i'll put mirren over there and i'll have his relationship with jeff over here and i'll have mm. him just and it just moves them in place and he takes his time. I think because he worked in television so much, he was sick of dialogue and sick of fast cuts. Yeah. And I think you can get that from this film. And he's going, I'm going to do the opposite of what I've always done in my career. And I'm going to create a British film that's really slow, that has yeah. doesn't have a lot of dialogue. It doesn't have to explain itself. You've got Jeff, who was uh, Charlie and casually, right? I mean, he's a, he's a miles away from that in this. He's incredible. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. incredible. You can see that just kind of sit back and take the time with the dialogue, the take the time with the scenes, the just enjoying the whole process of this film. And it makes it such a joy to watch. It's a very accomplished film. It's a very intelligent film. Yeah, and I love what Mackenzie does. He takes his time. Well, it's an undoubted classic. And to wrap us up with John Mackenzie, we've got a question for the film. As you may know, we've got a Patreon account where you can gain access to exclusive cutting room shows like this, created for and voted by our patrons. Mm-hmm. There's access to our entire podcast archive, over 120 episodes, and you can ask us questions for the show. So here's one of our patrons, Carl Stillman, to ask a question for the Long Good Friday, a personal favourite of his. Take it away, Carl. My all-time top favourite British gangster films are The Hit, Get Carter, The Long Good Friday, Lot, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels and Mona Lisa, with The Long Good Friday head and shoulders above the rest, in my opinion. How do you guys rank these films, and which one would you rank as number one? Keep up the good work, guys. Amazing podcast. Thanks very much for the question, Carl. Very mm. nice stuff. Good I'm going question. to take this first, and I'm going to go five to one. So okay. at the bottom, number five. Very surprising that I have the hit on Carl's list. Right. It's pretty much a forgotten film. An early effort by Stephen Free is starring great cast. Mm-hmm. John Hurd, Terrence Stamp, a very, very young Tim Roth. Yeah. Right. Although I like the film, it's at number five for me. Lockstock 4, it's very enjoyable. I like it, but when put up against the others in the list, it's not in the same league. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mona Lisa, it might have finished higher if I was a bit more familiar with it, but I only saw it first about a year ago. Mm-hmm. We talked about that on a Patreon podcast. Yeah, we did. Amazing yeah. Hoskins performance, Kathy Tyson in the lead. Bloody hell. Yeah. She's amazing. So that's mm-hmm. three. And then Sophie's Choice. So no, he didn't have that one in there. The two. I've... <laughs> 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 no, Sophie's that wasn't Choice. <laughs> So, although Sophie's choice, disappointing that Sophie's choice isn't in this. Yeah, um, I number one for me. I choose Carter on Long Good Friday, and it's really tough. I don't really know. Great locations in both, great lead performances. Um, I am going to say Long Good Friday because I've done a lot more work on that than Get Carter because we've never covered that. Mm. But ask me next week, it might be Get Carter. It's nah, really it's tough enough. to separate yeah, them. Yeah. It's fair enough. What about you, Westy? Um, I haven't seen two of the films on his list, unfortunately. I haven't seen The Hit. Um, and I haven't seen Mona Lisa, 
So what I've done mm. is I've replaced them with two that I have seen and <laughs> <laughs> Sophie's choice. <laughs> no, no, and, and put that in. in. Brie of so, no, so n- number one, Sophie's <laughs> choice. Yeah. <laughs> two, Zulu, Shind- number yeah. three. <laughs> number two, Schindler's List. Um, <laughs> no, I've gone for The Long Good Friday. <laughs> the Long Good Friday was on top for me. I haven't, even though I've just seen oh, it wow. recently, oh, wow. um, I've, I've had to put that on the top because okay. it seems like the blueprint. It seems mm. like everything else has come from that, uh, especially Lockstock. Um, which mm, comes in third definitely. for me, get caught a second. And then I would put in, instead of the hit Mona Lisa, I'll put in the Italian job and Leah Kick. I think Leah Kick's a great gangster film. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I've not seen the hit either. So unfortunately, that mm. would be five on this. The hit. The shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a great cast, though. So I am kind of intrigued by it. Yeah. Um, fourth, I've gone for Mona Lisa only because I've only seen that twice. It was pretty close between that and Lockstock because I've seen Lockstock lots, but I haven't seen it for about 20 years. It's very, very little between Long Good Friday and Good Carter. I would say just Get Card has been there longer for me. So I'll put Long Good Friday second, Get Card as number one. Well, despite his lack of cinematic pedigree, Mackenzie does solid work in making an out-and-out British classic in The Long Good Mm -hmm. Friday. The screenplay for The Long Good Friday was written by Barry Keefe. In his early career, he worked as a journalist before becoming a respected playwright. The Long Good Friday was his debut screenplay with only one other screenplay credit to his name. The first draft was completed in three days, originally called The Paddy Factor, which, you know, racist. (laughs) Outrageous. It went through at least half a dozen rewrites. The final draft had contributions from producer Barry Hansen, Mackenzie and Hoskins. Mm -hmm. So... It did go through a lot of changes. Westy, what do you think about the writing? Oh, I mean, for this to be like what is his first major screenplay and written it in three days, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's pretty outstanding. I mean, the, the yeah. amount of characters that were involved and how complicated this could be. And I just love the way they set things up and leave them. You know, as soon as he gets off that board at the start and you've got that close-up of the suitcase, I immediately pictured your two smiling faces. I thought, <laughs> these guys loved it. I mean, this is definitely up their street. Here we go. There's a brown leather suitcase. This is all very... Listen to that soundtrack. Look at them shoes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here we go. Right. But just the way that you forget about how important... It's, it opens on that close-up, and he gets mm. the money out and puts it in his pocket. And you mm. come to that end, set that, that exposition sequence, and you go, I totally forgot about that. I totally forgot about mm-hmm. he took that bit, and you don't really yeah. relate to it because there's so much in the middle of it. And I think that's just geniusly done. It's just really, really brilliant as a film from start to finish. It's just very, very accomplished screenplay. So I think this is a very British screenplay, and it's very, very authentic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm I'm absolutely the same as you, Westy, mm. the authenticity and the writing. It feels like real people, yeah. real dialogue. Oh, yeah. Compare this to Real names as well. Yeah. It's not like over the top yeah. with the names well, and stuff. It's well, of course, yeah. Very Colin, basic. Jeff, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Colin. Mick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Harold. <laughs> yeah. Harold. Compare this dialogue to something like a Guy Ritchie film, a later mm. Guy Ritchie film, The Gentleman, for example. Oh, yeah. Mm. I don't know if you've seen that, no. but, I mean, that's I almost have, yeah. like a caricature of, of a Londoner. Yeah. The amount of rhyme and slang is ridiculous yeah. and nobody nobody speaks like that no. but here you can feel the grit underneath your fingernails because you're that close to the street with these guys yeah. mm. Hoskins got loads of plaudits from London villains who wanted him to play them in movies of, of their life one of which was Ronnie Cray who wrote to Hoskins uh, a letter saying as much and Hoskins sent him a nice signed photo in return very nice oh, very nice <laughs> but a testament to how close it was to what was going on at the time and Keith's work as a, a journalist in London held him in good steady. He was working at the time the craze were in the heyday in the 60s, and he used some of the stories for the film, including the woman spitting in Jeff's face yeah. and the security guard being nailed to the ground. Wow. Yeah. Keith visited that guy who got nailed to the ground in hospital, and he asked him what happened, and the guy replied, it was a do-it-yourself accident. <laughs> 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 Keith Stone, <I> love it. <laughs> oh, Both hands nailed. How do you do that? <laughs> Horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> And there are a few real London gangsters that fill out the background artists in the film, one of which apparently told Mackenzie during one of the scenes. Not that I'd know, but you don't stab somebody like that. (laughs) 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 Wonderful. I would would imagine 
It's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I've been told. I mean, yeah, it's not I mean, like that. <laughs> friend of mine said from a friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> as well as the Paddy Factor, at one point the screenplay had the title "England for Sale," which. I think it's very fit and considering what would happen in the dec- decades that followed to mm. London, specifically the Docklands yeah. that Harold wants to develop. It's now Canary Wharf, one of the most identifiable places in Europe, the heart of big business. Yeah. The whole place has been gentrified. And what I love in that opening scene when Harold is giving his impassioned speech about redevelopment, they're on his boat going down the Thames. The place is literally being sold down the river. I yeah. really like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's writing... Keith Wright and foretold what would happen with Thatcherism in the 80s. Shanda embodies that as well, mm-hmm. a self-made man, a, a patriot with an eye for business. But yeah, very English, very British. Yeah. Um, in 2008, Keith said, gangsterism equals Thatcherism equals capitalism. <laughs> Simple as that. Loads of isms, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the Olympics as well, um, kind of foretold that. Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. 2012, London got the Olympics. So there's a real, real legitimacy to Keith's writing. He immersed himself in the culture at the time, and whether it was guesswork or not, he predicted the landscape of London for mm. the future, which I think is great. Yeah. Hands across the ocean. Very yeah. nice. <laughs> this is so strange. You got all this in three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> three days. Yeah. He needs to write another screenplay so we know what the fuck's going to happen in the next 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Matt? Love the writing and the, the bit I want to talk about is just Harold's dialogue because Harold Shant has yes, got yes. some of the best dialogue <laughs> the most, oh, yes. you'll ever hear. <laughs> I mean, it's just outrageously good. Yeah. Put some deodorant on. I'm heavily into personal protection. Because the thing is, like, as a character, to me, he always feels like he's a big kid and London is his massive, massive playset. Oh, no. I run London. And he doesn't like the fact that these other kids somewhere playing with it yeah so a lot of his outbursts sound quite childish like when he said about eric being killed by the bomb he goes you need a million dollar computer to understand this <laughs> like a million dollar computer what a way to put it and it's just, and yeah. i love it when he's explaining what's happened to errol he goes like barber's asshole being about 50 yards away from his brain he's not very heavy <laughs> Yeah. You know, just really and funny. the choir boys playing them the thing yeah. for the rest of them. Yeah. <laughs> like stuff he thinks is quite witty, but to me it just sounds like a kid having a tantrum. Someone's been playing Guy Fawkes and my roles and a touch of Jaws in the Lido. That's what's up, mate. And there's yeah. so many great lines. Some of them are really funny. You know, Colin going out like a raspberry ripple. Yeah. Which <laughs> yeah. I know the original line was going out like a truck ice, ice yeah. but Hoskins improvised that on yeah. the day and everyone thought it was much funnier. So that's, that's why he kept it in. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of dignity in that, isn't there? Going out like a raspberry ripple. And, and maybe the funniest one is when he's found out about that security guard, goes, you don't crucify people. Not on, on Good, good Friday. Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Any other day, it'd be all right. You don't like crucifying people outside a church, not on Good Friday. But Harold, he threatens people like no one else. You know, you've got his great long speeches kicking off at the mafia yeah. for not having Dunkirk spirit or great culture. Yeah. Bit more than an odd dog, know what I mean? Yeah. Bit more <laughs> than an odd dog. <laughs> a little bit more than an odd dog, know what I mean? Ah, know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or when he's having to go with Parky or the gangsters who he's got hanging upside down. But I, I think my favourite line of all, my favourite threat, is when he first finds out something's going on. It's like, I'll have his carcass dripping blood by midnight. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yes. yes. I'll have his carcass dripping blood by midnight. They've got mad what's yours. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go with uh, this one then, right? Okay, when he's on the boat and he's asking, uh, I don't know what the character's name is. It's probably Steve. It might be Terry, but he's Terry in Faulty Towers. Oh yeah, he's asking him if he knows it. He'd ask him if he knows anything. No, not not anything. Not, what? Nothing. No, nothing at all. And he says it's like one of those silent, deadly farts. No sign. Then pow, you go cross-eyed. <laughs> Silent, well, deadly fart. No clues, and then pow, you go cross-eyed. <laughs> it's the non-reactions from everyone around. <laughs> yeah, it's kind yeah. of like am I supposed to laugh at that? That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what really, I've got. Uh, um, it's it's Good Friday. Have a bloody Mary. I love that. Yeah. That's yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah. But yeah. it's when he's uh, it's, it's when he gets good. Billy and he's like, oh, "Don't be silly, Billy. You think I come hunting for you with my fingers?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And he walks out of frame. I think that's absolutely cl- yeah. brilliant. It's not a shooter, is it, Harold? Oh, don't be silly, Billy. When I come hunting for you with my fingers. And then when he's asking yeah. um, about the top grass, 
And he said, oh, I've known him a long time. So we well, should know his name then, shouldn't you? I think that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah great, great stuff. Like Mackenzie, Keith doesn't have a glittering movie career, but with a film like this under his belt, you don't need to do anything else. Of course really. not. Two great lead performances and a supporting cast stuffed full of future British TV talent. We're starting in the only logical place. Bob Hoskins as Harold Shan, the boy from Stepney. Mm-hmm. This is just such an incredible performance. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Hoskins fills this character with so much nuance and small details. He's not your typical gangster boss. You know, he's game for a laugh, but he's got fragility mm. and vulnerability. The emotion he shows about Colin when yeah, he dies. He cares about everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, And Colin, that's another thing as well. Very progressive to have a gay character in a film in 1981. And add to that, that he's Harold's best friend. Yeah. How many feared gangster kingpins in a film have got a gay best friend? Yeah. Like, they know now. Yeah. Great writing. Yeah, that yeah. they know Great about stuff. as well, like openly mm-hmm. and then accept exactly. them of it. It's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And at the other end of the scale, Harold can erupt like a volcano. Mm. And a lot of that stuff is in the writing, but it's beautifully realized by Hoskins. He starts off like he's king of the world, strutting through the airport like he owns the joint. Yeah. With that music booming. Yeah, it's great. And that's compounded by his magnificent hands across the ocean speech on the boat. And he, he's presented, kind of presented himself as a legitimate businessman, but things start to crumble very fast in the plot. And Hoskins' performance follows that at every turn. I, I wholeheartedly believe that moment that he's losing it and he roughs Victoria up. Yeah. yeah, awful moment. Mm-hmm. But he's under so much stress that his actions are uncharacteristic, and he can't believe he would ever do anything to hurt Victoria. But that moment also sets up the un- uncontrollable violence that he's capable of. Yes, and we see that a few scenes later when he makes mincemeat out of Jeff, who mm-hmm. goads him into reacting just like Victoria did. Mm-hmm. That point of view shot of him jamming the broken bottle into the yeah. camera. Yeah, that's such a striking image and a really shocking moment. And that severed jugular spraying blood everywhere. Is so effective. Yeah. It's sickening. And you feel that pain, don't you? You feel that friendship. It's just, yeah. It's very tough. It's brilliant. Very tough brilliantly to done. Mm. Brilliantly done. Mm-hmm. Originally, Jeff wasn't sliced up with a broken bottle. There are swords on display behind Harold when he's at his desk yes. on the mm. boat, and he pulls one down and chops Jeff, Jeff's head off, which uh, obviously <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty dramatic. <laughs> And then the scene where he gives Charlie and Tony a monumental dressing down at the end yeah. is legendary. Yeah. Like you said, Matt, Harold's dialogue, it's just a thing of beauty. Mm. You know, things like, uh, I'm glad I found out in town just what a partnership with a pair of wankers like you would have been. The <laughs> yeah. sleeping partner's one thing, but you're in a fucking coma. Yeah. <laughs> that is just, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> It's when he stops and turns around, you're like, he's got more to say here. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. here he goes. Oh, I've just yeah. thought, yeah, I know this is done, but I need to get my point across. I need to get, across. <laughs> need to yeah. get this off my yeah. chest. <laughs> Amazing. And quite a chest it is. <laughs> Great. Yeah, massive. <laughs> Loads on there. <laughs> <laughs> and Harold's your typical patriotic Englishman from this era. There's a lot of talk in this and that speech in that diatribe about uh, the war touch of the Dunkirk yeah, spirit, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And even when I was a kid in the 80s, the war was still very much in the minds and consciousness of, mm-hmm. of culture and society, even though it had ended like 35, 40 years ago. And this informs Harold's dialogue about his new partner. He's going into partnership with the Germans. Yeah, the Kratz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've got ambition, know-how, and they, they don't, don't lose their, their bottle. bottle. And this is very much an English or a British sensibility, stiff up and lividness, mm-hmm. laughing in the face of adversity, strong will. And Harold embodies all of that. And it fits in with my idea of what it meant to be English in the 80s, based on yeah. like the culture and what I was told and what I was brought up with. Yeah. And his final line, the mafia, I've shit them. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. one of my favorite lines yeah. in yeah. any film, because yeah. they might not even know what that means. Yeah. yeah. And he's done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No retort. Yeah. Out. Uh, out and the great irony is that despite his bravado and confidence in that scene as soon as he leaves the hotel boom he gets taken down in the blink of an eye yeah yeah don't fall harold's got complexity and vulnerability despite being this seemingly all-powerful gangster and that that's what makes the character so great and an outrageous performance from hoskins it's unbelievable Yeah. yeah He's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Love it. L- love that scene where he meets the widow at the graveside. Yes. When he's stuck yeah, on yeah. The- what about you, Westy? Who are you going for? I'm going to go for Helen Mirren because I think mm, there's nobody else I could see as a partner to Hoskins in this film and stand up yeah. and have that much demeanor and that much presence and that much yeah. confidence in the in her performance. She's she makes as many decisions as he does, if not more. 
if not the more important decisions, to speak to the Americans, to tell them what's going on, to keep them on site, to keep the deal going. She has that ele- that that scene with Jeff in the elevator, and she just knows that he, maybe he's not right. She keeps herself right. She keeps herself centered. And then, like you said, when when he turns on her, when Harold turns on her, and he's he's kind of and, and goes, and I saw she just genuinely is broken down by that. Like I didn't expect you to break that with me. I thought I could say anything to you. I thought we were yeah. solid. You see that relationship break down and then fix, but she doesn't seem to me to be like someone who needs any help. You know, after the pub blows up, you take them away, go to the restaurant. He can totally just yeah. trust her to do it. And she drives. And I exactly. think that's really yeah. important. Great. She's like, I'll drive. I'm taking you somewhere. I'm taking them out of there. I think Helen Mirren's done that throughout her whole career. She'll go, am I taking this part? This is what I've got to think about it. This is what I'm going to yeah. do. And I know she was instrumental talking to Mackenzie, talking to Keith about how she wanted to develop the character and have the strength behind the character, have the confidence behind the character. And she does sit equally with Hoskins when they're together. And they're talking. It's just a joy when they're on the board at the start <laughs> and they're having the Bloody Mary. Yeah. And she's kind Great. of like, lay off the vodka. And he's like, lay off the vodka. Does that like kiss thing? And he says, he's going to have it anyway. But she, <laughs> we can talk about Hoskins till the cows come home, especially the final sequence, which is just on him. But when that camera cuts to her and you see her vulnerable, oh. that sells the end for me. You see Razor's in the front being shot. Blink and you'll miss it. Yeah. But I've paused it and yeah, he's yeah, kind yeah. of slumped yeah. over with a gunshot wound in the back of his head. And you see it's done. You know the film's done because she's done incredible yeah. performance. Agreed. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's like she's the one that stops like Harold going over the top with uh, the businessman at the beginning. Yeah. She's like, no, no. He, he wants Pretty to go good. to sleep. Leave him alone. Stop hassling him. She stops everyone. Time to talk yeah. After later. he's killed Jeff, she's the only one who yeah. calm him. And she looks. Yeah. She just looks at him. Slap him and about. she's hitting him yeah. and she's just looking at him. And there's no dialogue. And you can see in her performance, she's like, I'm the, nobody else, Razors or anyone else would have just went, right, get in the car, what we're going to do. And she has yeah. to, she gets a hold of him and he's dragging her. And mm. she's not letting go of him. She does it with nails. Yeah. And it's brilliant to see. Mm. It is fantastic. Yeah. An amazing yeah. performance. Two amazing performances in there. Unbelievable. Mm. What are you going for? Who are you going for? Who am I going for? I'm going for pretty much everybody else because <laughs> this is such a good just film. Bring it up, bring up the rear. Yeah, yeah, just, just everyone laziness. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's it's like before they were famous. This film, it, it's yeah. brilliant for that. So many yeah. familiar faces, yeah. particularly from a British perspective. And we have mentioned some already, but again, Pierce Brosnan. This is his debut film, yeah. and obviously in in his scenes at the beginning, he's sharing that with Paul Freeman. This is years before Belloc. I really like how there's, there's like a lot of sitcom connections in yes. this one as well because you got Paul Barber as Errol the Ponce, yep. you know, getting, you know, slash rub, getting his buttocks slash, probably better known as Denzel. Yes. Money Fields and Horses. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then talking to Vady sitcoms, you've got a Carl Howman in here who was massive in the 80s yeah. for Bush yeah. Strokes. Yeah, Bush Strokes. He's yeah. the young copper yeah. on Howell's board. Yeah. Um, We've mentioned Brian Hall already. He's one of Harold's henchmen, but he's better known as Terry, the cook from Faulty Towers. Tellers, yeah. So, yeah, he's in there. Waldorf and salad. you can tell Guy Ritchie loves this film because <laughs> of two yeah, of his favourites are in here. You've got Alan Ford as Jack yeah. and P.H. Moriarty as Razors. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're all great in these small roles. It, it's such a good cast. But the weird one, we've mentioned him already, is Derek Thompson as Jeff because in this, he's such a slimy little weasel who ultimately everything <laughs> is his fault as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned Paul Barber, Matt, who plays mm. Harold the Ponce from Brixton. He, yeah. Denzel, and only fools. <laughs> yeah. He did yeah. some theatre work with Keith, who asked him to come on set and speak to Frenzy McKenzie. And there was no audition. He was just told to go into the pub. There's the script. Learn your lines. Okay. And a couple of hours later, he was on set doing the scene and he, he had to drink a lot of coffee because he'd had a few too many in the boozer. Um, <laughs> and he was actually terrified in that scene because he'd never been on a film set before with. And, and he was like facing Hulk and P.H. Moriarty standing in front of him with a machete. He actually thought he was in a snuff film. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, no wonder he's, he's so good himself. in the film. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's genuinely yeah. Oh, yeah. fuck it, he's, no! He's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned Alan Ford there, man. Yeah. This yeah. one line of dialogue was just beautiful just before he sends all the boys out to, uh, to find out who's doing it. Mm. Um, it's on. It's on him, and he's like, "Well, Chopper's in the booth." <laughs> <laughs> I had to look that up. What does "booth" mean? He means he's in prison. Chopper's in yeah. prison. How about the Finsbury Park hillbillies? I like the sing song, but who's your fancy for a lullaby? Well, Chopper's in the boob. Oh, yeah, very good, very good. I mean, one one member of the cast I am slightly unconvinced by is Jeff. 
I think some mm. of his line readings aren't fantastic. And, and and when he says to Victoria, I want to lick every inch of you. Oh, oh I can't watch. Oh, it's oh, horrible. Yes. Yeah. I want to lick every inch of you. So, a great before there were famous ensemble cast, but Long Good Friday is all about the volcanic performance of Bob Hoskins as Harold Shand, aided by the always wonderful Helen Mirren. Amazing. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the film, but there are three particular scenes that we've picked out as individual highlights. Westy, over to you, yes. my son. <laughs> <laughs> Got my wedding suit on. Um, <laughs> it's that scene where Hoskins gives the speech on the boat on the Thames. And oh, yes. You've oh. got Tower Bridge framed behind him. Hmm. And he's moving further and further away, and Tower Bridge is just framed hmm. perfectly in the middle. And Tower Bridge was built for better access to the East End to expand commercial potential. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to improve the Docklands, which are based in the lower east and southeast London. So it's the east end of London. He's trying to develop the Docklands, which is what they did and why they built Tower Bridge. And he's basically the film showing you that he's moving further and further away from his dream. And it's mm. not going to happen Fantastic. in that one shot. Yeah. Lovely. And that's mind blowing. And I've done a fashion shoot on the Thames, right, for a clothing company. And we had to shoot under the, the Tower Bridge. And it is incredibly difficult to time that because the mm. boat's going at a certain speed and you've got to try and get that there. Not to mention the dialogue. Not to mention everyone else on there. And to get that nailed, that's that's a one at. You've only got one chance to do that. So you've got to come all the way up the shipping channel then you've got to come all the way back and you can't shoot it the other way. So you have to come back through and then back again. That's going to take about four hours. So mm -hmm. to get that nailed, the amount of pressure on Hoskins to do that and the balls from Mackenzie to do it as he's going through and it just it's just framed beautifully. It's the whole film in one shot. Perfect. Oh, I want to talk about the abattoir scene. It's oh, wonderfully yeah. set up. Um, that scene when Harold is tooling his, up his entire crew, the end, let's try and be yeah. discreet. Brilliant. Yeah. Loads it's of really, guns. <laughs> loads of guns. <laughs> Too many. And he doesn't want anyone to get hurt. Just scare them with all of this shit. Yeah. The license is in the post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shooting the pigeons off the caravan route. <laughs> you really get a sense of how big Harold's operation is. There's a, this huge mob of heavies willing to go to the mattresses for him. Amazing. And it's hilarious when they pick up Billy in the bar. This mustachioed, bald and middle-aged man who's got two yeah. young girls hanging off his every word like no that's never gonna happen yeah and he's like all accommodating <laughs> with harold he's in there well just, i'll turn get them to turn the music down yeah it's a live band <laughs> it's a live band exactly <laughs> turn it down <laughs> turn the drums down will you harold's here <laughs> jesus <laughs> And he's talking, he's talking when they're outside, he's talking about, well, if you can throw some business my way, and then Razor just slams him into the wall. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it's not a shooter, is it, Harold? <laughs> <laughs> of course it Don't is. Of course it is. Don't yeah. be silly, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he's called Billy, shooter. isn't it? Just for that yeah. line. Don't be yeah, silly, brilliant. Billy. Yeah, 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 brilliant. And then we're in the abattoir. Frostbite or verbals? Amazing line. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And I just love the menace of the scene when all the chaps are carted out from the back of the van. They're hung up like huge slabs of meat behind them. Yeah, well, this is where Harold's clearly starting to lose his grip. He's gone to some very theatrical lengths to put the frighteners up these guys. Yeah. It was Hoskins' idea to hang them upside down, a really striking image. Uh, and in between takes, they had to be held up by the crew in case they all passed out and got yeah. the blood rushing through their You can see brilliant. that, though. And I love it when Parky comes in, which... He does, on a number of occasions, very conveniently, ah, yeah. park, <laughs> just in time, <laughs> bad time. <laughs> ah, Parky, about time. Hello, Parky. I'm afraid the dinner's got a little bit burnt. Two really great long shots of the two characters as they walk towards each yeah. other in that scene. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Harold gives him a slap, and yeah. you can see his anger yeah. begin to boil over. Great. But on the back of what I said about Derek Thompson as Jeff, he ponces into that room with a flat cap and a sheepskin coat. <laughs> What's going on? Looking ridiculous. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he attacks Billy for no reason. <laughs> and his punches are crap. Just yeah. forearming him. Yeah. You bastard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be perfect for casualty him. <laughs> <laughs> 
But despite Jeff's performance, it's a really cinematic scene. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's fantastic. And Matt, mm. there's only oh, one. Oh, what are you going one for? Only. What are you going yeah. for? There is only one, isn't there? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to bring it home, lads, because it is the scene that made me want to watch it in the first oh, place. Hoskins yeah. in the shower. It really. <laughs> Hoskins in the shower. Cannot, cannot get enough of it. 90 minutes of that, that'd be amazing. <laughs> No, but you know what? It really is as good as Empire claimed it to be back then yeah. because it's beautifully set up because it does that thing I love where a character gets right to their peak because Harold's blown away the IOA, or so he thinks. Mm-hmm. In all cases, that's the guys. deal. He's told the Americans where to stick it. He's going to go in with the crowds instead. He's back. He's Lord of the Manor Brilliant. until he gets in that cab. Yeah. And like Westy mentioned, that brief shot of Victoria screaming in the other car mm-hmm. after some unknown fate, spine that, chilling that shot. Oh, yeah, really horrendous. Is, like, Holy shit. But can you imagine being an actor and being told the whole climax of the film is going to rest on you with no dialogue and it's just the expression on your face? That pressure must have been incredible because if Hoskins can't deliver, I don't think Mackenzie has an ending. He would just have to cut the black straight Mm. away. And yet Hoskins, he gives you everything you need and more. He said, I'm going to sit you in the back of the car and I'm going to put a camera on your face. I said, blimey, they'll be going out in droves. Yeah, you're going to play. He said, no, no. He said, you do it. And Hoskins was told, camera's going to be new for five minutes. You've got no dialogue. And John McKenzie was sat in one of the front seats. And the, his direction of Hoskins was, I'm going to tell you the story of this film from beginning to end. Just react to it. Yeah. So that's what Howell's doing. He's piecing through that whole day's events in his head and working out how he's ended mm. up there. And you can see every emotion oh. on his face. Surprise, anger defiance, resignation, and even, I think, a little bit of grudge and admiration. Yeah, definitely. You know, like, okay, well done. You got me in your own backyard. Yeah. And with that music, it's nothing short of mesmerizing. Mm-hmm. And for the story this is telling, this is a final shot I'd put up there with The Godfather. It's just wow. monumentally good. Wow. Huge. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. It's worth mentioning as well mm. that Brosnan and Hoskins never worked together on the film. Like they were shot on mm. different nights, weren't they? So yeah, that, that's, that right. that's right. Shot and then reverse shot yeah. was completely different. Uh, in the front, uh, that's uh, Mackenzie driving. Oh, nice. In right. the front yeah. of the car. Yeah. And uh, Phil Mayu, the DP, he sat in the front and used a uh, light plugged into the cigarette lighter, 50 watt. Yeah, bulb just a bulb on the, the side of the camera. Was it? Yeah. Hoskins. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, genius. Three outrageously good scenes from the mm. film that we've chosen there, and Incredible. that ended one of the very best. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Unforgettable. Yeah. Summary and score for the Long Good Friday. Matt, would you like to go first? Mm. Sure. I mean, what's not love about this film? It's mm-hmm. got a mix yeah. of elements that are on the face of it aren't that distinctive or that special, but I think that demonstrates that making a film have an impact is much harder than it sounds. Because actually, I don't think we do gangster films all that well. It's very rare that a British gangster film is good, let alone excellent like this one is. And it's to do with the soundtrack. It's to do with the location shooting, which which I love. It's to do with Mackenzie's visual storytelling. But so much of it is down to the character of Harold, who is brilliantly written. I mean, you could say he's a pretty horrible person overall, but I have enormous sympathy for him at the end. And there's a real tragic element, to be honest, to see his downfall. And his empire crumbles in the space of just one day and you can't see it coming and none of it's his fault. Yeah. So, yeah, I think Harold, just one of the great, greatest British film characters of all time. And that Hos- Hoskins performance, sensational. So the only thing for me, is this an absolute all-time favourite? Probably not. I don't watch it that often. And to go back to the Patreon question, it is one I'd have a little bit below Get Carter. So it is splitting hairs, really. But just for that reason, it just misses out on the top marks. But it's still a pretty excellent 9.5, all the same. 9.5. Huge score. What about you, Westy? It is huge. Yeah, I mean, I came to this late, um, and I'm so pleased that I did. And it's very rare that I could say that about a film. I've heard a lot about it. I knew what the ending was going to be. I knew the Hoskins was going to be amazing. I knew Mirren was going to be amazing. I didn't know much else about it. And I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it, so much so that I watched it twice. A very important film, and I got that just from not doing much research at all but just watching it i I realized how important it was how um substantial it is and how timeless it really is even though the themes are around the time and it is of the time 
tender hooks here, isn't it? Um, I'm at it the is. abattoir. I'm yeah, upside down. Um, I don't we're, quite. We're know, upside I down. don't quite know where, where to go with it. I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm going to say everyone needs to see this film if you're into cinema, especially if you're into British cinema, because it's very important. I'm going to give it a full mark. I'm going to give it a 10. Wallop. Wow. Pow. I, love wow. It. I, I fucking loved very it. Very nice. It's brilliant. Yeah. Wow. wow. Very nice. Okay. Well, I mean, um, well, you know what's coming from me. Yeah. I've got so much affection 8, 8. for 5. this film. 8.5. <laughs> 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 a lot of my affection for the film comes down to the Bob Hoskins' magnetism. He's at his very best. Yeah. And I think what's very telling for me is that despite his horrendous behavior character, Harold, there's never one moment that I'm not on his side. Like all the best anti-heroes. Yeah. Captures a moment in time that's long been forgotten, but also foresaw what would happen in the years that followed as well. Pretty amazing stuff, yeah. really. Yeah. Direction from Mackenzie and writing from mm-hmm. Keith, both big positives and a great supporting cast. I mentioned a few niggles that I have. The complexity of the story is dumped on you in that scene near the end, and and you have to keep up. You have to listen, which is difficult when they all seem to have like the same name, particularly Jeff. And there's a Charlie, but Jeff's name, Derek Thompson, is called Charlie in ca- casualty, so that's kind of like a, a thing <laughs> in retrospect. It's very confusing. Yeah. But that'll never put me off the film, and I will return to it again and again. An easy 10, I mean, without without hesitation. So overall, the Long Good Friday mm. comes out with a fully deserving big score of twenty nine point five out of thirty. Mm. Huge, oh, yeah, incredible film. Huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you enjoyed the show, please like the video, or subscribe to our YouTube account if you haven't already, and share with your friends and on your social media platforms wherever you can. Do it, or you know, we might send the boys round. Yeah, right. Have your carcass driven yeah. blood by midnight. Have some verbals with you. <laughs> 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 yeah. Leave us some comments in the comments section. Let us know your favourite Hoskin line from the film, your top five British gangster films, yeah. whatever you'd like. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And to support us, you can become an All The Right Movies Patreon supporter, gain access to bonus videos, hundreds of hours of exclusive podcasts, and that really helps us out, everyone. Yeah. The more support we get, the more we can dedicate our time yes. to putting out more videos. Definitely. We'd like that. We'd love that. Thank yes. you, guys. And that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. We're going out like a raspberry ripple. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, what a way to go. <laughs> Not much dignity in that. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay. Again, another success, fellas. Yeah, it was good. Great stuff. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Oh, really yeah. good. I could that stay really longer. We actually could that. talk a bit more about that like yeah. racetrack scene, maybe, and I could, I could just edit it into the conversation that we... Mm. That we, when I do my edits, yeah, um, about 10 15 minutes, just take us straight, take us straight through. I think that'll be fine. Yeah, no bother. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Okay, bye. You two can't wait to leave, can you? Well, I'm glad I found out in time what a partnership with a pair of wankers like you two is like.